Good morning, buenas tardes, boa tarde. My name is Noel Campbell. I'm the Associate Director of the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies here at the Australian National University. Together with my colleague, Luis Salvador Carula, the head of the Centre for Mental Health Research, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today to this fourth session in a series of five webinars on the public health and policy impact of COVID-19 in Latin America. In line with the custom here at ANU, we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands the university is located and pay respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the collaboration of the universities of Newcastle, Notre Dame, New South Wales, and the Sydney University Research Community for Latin America. As you can see from the slide, today's seminar will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on mental health in Latin America. I'll shortly call on Luis to introduce the session and our three speakers. Please note that all webinars in the series will be recorded and made available publicly. After the three presentations, Luis will moderate a session uh, drawing on questions that we invite you to submit using the chat function at the foot of your screen. If you need to contact any of us during the session, please use the same chat facility to send a private message. You can also follow comments on the presentation via Twitter by going to the handles indicated on the screen. But before passing the screen to Luis, let me provide a brief summary of the main points we made at webinar number three last week, in case you were not all able to participate. Webinar three focused on the experience of managing COVID-19 in three countries of Central America and the Caribbean, Mexico, Costa Rica and Cuba. The speakers began by giving an overview of the ways in which the health systems of their respective countries handled COVID. Clearly, there are certain similarities. All three countries were affected by the pandemic at about the same time, with the first cases being recorded in March. Their governments responded with declarations of national health emergencies, which were accompanied subsequently by mitigation measures such as social distancing, limits on travel, closure of borders and selective lockdowns. In each case, it was agreed that the lifting of those measures would be triggered, theoretically at least, when certain milestones were reached. But there were also important differences between the three countries. They had different political systems. The Cuban government, for example, has controls over the levers of power not available in democracies like Mexico and Costa Rica. Cuba also stood out in terms of health spending as a percentage of GDP. According to the World Bank, whereas health spending in Cuba amounts to about 12% of GDP, the comparable figure in Mexico is 6%, with Costa Rica somewhere in between. Evidently, the scale of the challenge is more daunting in a country like Mexico, with a population of 126 million, compared with Cuba or Costa Rica, where the populations are much smaller. And whereas Mexico and Costa Rica have a mix of public and private healthcare services, in Cuba, primary health care is provided almost exclusively by the public sector. So the obvious conclusion is that there can be no one-size-fits-all approach in dealing with the pandemic. Referring more explicitly to their country-specific situations, the speakers noted that there were significant differences in numbers of COVID-related cases and fatalities. Mexico has recorded just over a million cases, or 10% of the number of cases in Latin America as a whole, and has 103,000 deaths. It also has one of the highest fatality rates from COVID in the world, 62 deaths per 100,000 people. This record is compounded by a relatively low testing rate, which means that even these statistics are in all probability a significant underestimate. The example of Mexico compares with Costa Rica, which has 133,000 cases and 1,662 deaths, while Cuba has recorded an impressively low 7,950 cases and 133 deaths. So 
How did governments react? What were the main health policy actions they took? Mexico was somewhat unique in terms of political leadership, with the president claiming in June that the most difficult part of the pandemic was over, at precisely the same moment when the WHO warned that Mexico is facing its most dangerous moment. In Costa Rica and Cuba, and to be fair, at the state and local government levels in Mexico, governments did acknowledge the reality of the pandemic and intervened with a range of mitigation and containment measures from closure to borders, of borders to increase in testing, to local area quarantines and lockdowns. Obviously, some aspects of the response to the pandemic worked better than others. Let me refer to a couple of examples that the speakers cited as being positive. In Mexico and Costa Rica, because of the severity of the pandemic, government funding was diverted from other priorities to the health sector to strengthen its capacity. Cuba had the advantage of having a strong, centrally planned and relatively well-resourced public health system, which made implementation of implement intervention measures much more effective. For example, it moved very quickly to engage in widespread screening and testing, as well as establish establishing systems for surveillance and contact tracing. In terms of institutional response, the speaker from Costa Rica referred to the establishment of an ad hoc committee of the National Academy of Sciences, which was mandated to recommend health actions to the government. The rationale being to ensure that so far as possible, policy responses were evidence-based. On the other hand, with the benefit of hindsight, there were clearly aspects of responses by governments that could be improved. All three speakers emphasized the need to better align economic and health measures. In Mexico and Costa Rica, because of such a high percentage of people working in the informal economy, it was always going to be unrealistic to expect a lockdown to be effective when those people need to mobilize and socialize in order to feed their families. In both those countries, plans to reopen the economy were given priority over fully meeting the agreed milestones for relaxing mitigation measures. And this coincided with a second wave of cases with the results that became painfully evident. The lifting of restrictions was premature. In all three countries, the pandemic impacted neg negatively on marginalized groups, such as the elderly or people living in rural areas and indigenous people. These impacts would have been significantly less if those groups had had greater access to information and communications technology. Other areas for improvement included the inadequacy of testing capability, with Cuba being the exception. Similarly, the lack of capacity, initially at least, to track and trace the spread of COVID. And in some cases, the inconsistency of messaging, not only between political leaders and health professionals, but in some cases between different ministries and agencies of the same government. In the meantime, of course, COVID has had far-reaching socioeconomic impacts, resulting in huge economic contractions, especially in sectors such as tourism, hospitality, and the arts. In the case of Cuba, it compounded an already weak economy, grappling with the challenge of an economic embargo by its northern neighbor on trade and commercial activities. In all three countries, there was a rise in unemployment, a rise in rates of poverty, homelessness and domestic violence. And inevitably, all these factors had a negative impact on the mental health of citizens, about which we will learn more from the speakers in today's webinar. Looking to the future, the three speakers identified some lessons learned from the experiences of managing COVID in their respective countries. The importance of having an integrated national policy, the need to act early, swiftly and decisively, the need to invest in health infrastructure and medical research and technology. The priority attached to caring and protecting health workers. The need for clear and consistent messaging between and within governments. And the need to have in place a framework to manage access to and distribution of a vaccine when it becomes available. So that concludes my rather hasty summary of webinar three. 
let me now pass the screen to my colleague, Luis Salvador Carula, to introduce today's webinar and our three speakers. Luis, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noel. Um, and uh, um, um, I think uh, we are in a critical moment. It was um, announced yesterday that the world has re has peaked to 60 million declared cases of uh, COVID, and the um, number of deaths are around one and a half million of declared deaths. So we are really facing a, a major problem. And in this context um, is where we would like to uh, have a special seminar devoted to aspects um, related to mental health. Um, uh, this is related to our previous series at uh, the Center for Mental Health uh, Research at the Australian National University, where we analyze um, the impact of COVID-19 on mental health in a series of um, eight countries and, and sites around the world. Um, this um, um, uh, uh, gave uh, rise to two papers, one on general issues on the rapid response to crisis and, and health systems lessons from the active period of COVID-19 in these eight countries, and another one on the international experiences on uh, mental health care. Um, one of the uh, key issues that we learned in this first series in March, April, was that for the first uh, time in, in the history of diseases uh, and crisis and health crisis, mental health has been considered as a, a major topic and uh, a major focus of attention everywhere in the world. And as part of um, uh, this uh, focus, we would like um, uh, to revise what is the situation of um, of uh, the impacts of, in mental health of uh, COVID-19. And in order to do that, we have a fantastic group of people who um, are going to uh, talk to us about the situation in uh, three countries where we have revised what is the context of uh, uh, general health care, um, public uh, health and policy in relation to COVID. Um, and we will start with uh, um, the situation in Chile, then uh, we would move to Mexico and then to Brazil, and at the end we will have a series of um, uh, questions and answers. And in order to start that, uh, we have Dr. Matias Irrazabal, he's the uh, Director of Mental Health at the Ministry of Health in Chile. Uh, he also works uh, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and has several research projects with the aim of implementing prevention programs and, um, and uh, scaling up public health systems in Chile. Uh, Chile is um, a benchmark in, um, in health and in mental health in Latin America. Um, we are uh, really glad to have Matias here to explain us what is the situation in Chile. Thank you, Matias. Thank you very much, uh, Luis Salvador, and, and, and thank you, the Australian National Center for Studies and, and Cent for Latin American Studies and Center for Mental Health Research uh, for organizing this, um, this webinar. I'm very glad to be here, uh, connected with so many people, and uh, to, to talk about uh, um, the situation of uh, COVID and mental health uh, with a focus on, on, on the region, on, on Latin America, but also with some mentions uh, about Chile. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, I will try to share my screen now. Okay. So the first case of uh, COVID-19 in the Americas uh, was confirmed in the USA on January 2020, and, and Brazil reported the first case for Latin America and the Caribbean on February 26th. Uh, since then, COVID-19 has, has spread to uh, 50 countries in the Americas. And, and despite the effort, the region of the 
Americas accounts for the majority of, uh, of new COVID-19 death worldwide. And it's been very difficult for the region to control the, sp the, the, the spread of the, of the disease and, and, the, and the contagious. Um, many countries in the Americas can and, and have already dealt uh, with uh, the health impact of a small or medium-sized emergency situations using local resources and staff. However, major impact disasters as the pandemic uh, completely overwhelm the affected country's capacity to respond. Worse yet, when a pandemic occurs simultaneously in several countries, like in, in Latin America, it limits the capacity of any one country to respond to its own needs, and let alone to assist, assist uh, its neighbors. We also know that in emergency, people are affected in, in different ways and require different kinds of support. And that's why a uh, key to organizing mental health and psychosocial support is to develop a layered system of complementary supports that meets the need of different groups. This may be illustrated by a well-known intervention pyramid uh, as shown in the, in the slide, in which all layers are important and should ideally be implemented concurrently. The problem in Chile and many other countries of the region is that instead of building local capacities, supporting self-help and strengthening the resources already present, during the first months of the pandemic, we focused mainly on the specialized services. The well-known COVID-19 hospital beds was very important in Chile. And the other layers were left behind. On the other hand, thanks to PAHO, the assistance and the history of big earthquakes in Chile, we already had implemented before the pandemic the mental health, emergency and disaster risk management framework. So education, response and recovery actions were integrated in a coordinated intersectoral action. Based on evidence from recent, recent pandemics, for example, SARS or MERS, poor mental health status before, before the quarantine is a major risk factor for the, uh, exacerbating the severity and duration of psychiatric morbidity after quarantine. And that's why WHO um, developed a survey which is called the Rapid Assessment of Service Delivery for Mental, Neurological and Substance Use Disorders during the COVID-19 pandemic in collaboration with the six WHO regional offices. And in the Americas, the survey was sent to the 35 PAHO member states, and of these 29 countries, 83% responded. I'm going to show you a, a little bit about uh, this survey and, and uh, what, what can be a, a general overview hmm, of the um, mental health response uh, in the pandemic. So 27 of 29 countries, 93% reported that mental health was part of the national COVID-19 response plans. However, only 7%, two of the 29 countries, ensure full funding for the mental health response in their government budgets for the plan. And 55%, responded that they had secured partial funding and 31% reported having no funding for mental health activities at all. The lack of funding by countries is a major concern and might reflect the inability of these countries and um, pretty much the region to implement the existing COVID-19 mental health components of national plans. More than half of the countries, 60% of them, reported that psychotherapy and counseling services were partially or completely disrupted, while 11 of 28 countries reported disruptions in diagnostic and laboratory services uh, at mental health facilities. Among the interventions uh, or services related to, to substance use, opioid agonist maintenance treatment for opioid dependence was completely disrupted in 30% of the countries and partially disrupted in another 30% of the countries. And in 15 countries that responded over those prevention and management programs were completely disrupted in 26% and partially disrupted in 40%. That's pretty much a, an, an overview of the impact of the service disruption during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So in countries where asked also about national levels governmental policies on, on access to essential services for, for mental disorders, and this included 10 settings and categories of services for mental disorders, like for example, um, let me show you the, the next one. Yeah, like for example, uh, inpatient and outpatient services at mental hospitals, outpatient services, inpatient psychiatric and neurological units, as well as treatment of substance use disorders at general hospitals, primary health care, residential home, daycare services at community level. No country reported full closure of all 10 categories of services for mental disorders nor did any country in the region report having all services fully open. And as you may see in the, in, the, in, the, in the slide, the services that were most disrupted were the community-based services. So, um, Nineteen of the twenty-seven countries, almost seventy percent of the countries reported that inpatient services at mental hospitals remain fully open, and sixty percent reported that psychiatric inpatient units in general hospitals were fully open. Neurology inpatient units, uniquely dealing with a wide range of life-saving interventions, including for COVID-19 manifestations, were reported as being partially closed in thirty-seven percent of the countries. And inpatient services for substance use disorders were the most affected among all mental health inpatient services, with services fully closed in 20% of the countries and partially closed in 30% of the countries. For community-based services, residential services were the least affected. And they, uh, they were reported open in 70% of the countries, but on the other hand, the care was significantly disrupted and was either partially or fully closed in 60% of the countries that responded. So patient services in mental hospitals and general hospitals were fully open in 14 of 27 countries, almost half, and 12 of 26 countries, uh, almost half, respectively. And outpatient services in mental hospitals were partially closed in 50% uh, of the countries. So the survey also um, included information um, about the main causes of the reported disruptions and, and among all the countries that has responded to the survey, the leading cause of service disruption were a decrease in outpatient attendance due to patients not presenting to mental health uh, facilities, travel restrictions, uh, hindered access to health facilities, and a decrease in patient care due to cancellation of elective care. So, so those are types of the, of the causes uh, of uh, um, decrease in, in service utilization. And insufficient number of staff to provide services were also reported. In Chile and many other countries, we have the staff that, that, that uh, had the disease, that has uh, the COVID. And, um, and that was a reason that, for example, 30% of the countries uh, decreased um, the service utilization. Um, and many other things happen uh, in different countries, uh, as for example, insufficient supplies of personal protective equipment, which was very important in the first stage in Chile, but uh, still very important uh, in many other countries. And there's also some limited supplies of health products hmm, that was uh, reported a cause of service disruption in at least one third hmm, of the countries in the region. So going back to, to Chile, um, when the COVID-19 pandemic was posing significant health lifestyle and, and economic challenges for Chileans, and, and, and the evidence showed that there was likely to be a negative, significant negative mental health impact as a result, the attention of the politicians and the president was raised and a presidential initiative was designed to reduce the effects of COVID. It was an important decision, but one that required a lot of work and joint effort. It was not um, a, a magical decision. It, it was not something that, that comes uh, uh, in one day. A national commission was constituted and academic institutions, scientific societies, civil society, and parliamentarians were nimble in responding to the increasing support needs in six areas. Strengthening health systems, strengthening community mental health, 
risk communication, healthcare workers and workplace, alcohol and substance use prevention, and mental well-being support services. The partnership and collaboration across health, other sectors and communities enable best use of resources to deliver co cohesive and coordinated care and support and an integrative approach to social and emotional well-being that acknowledges the complex context of mental wellness and the role of social determinants was included. As a result of this great collaborative work, mental health actions were finally considered essential components of the national response to COVID-19, and mental health and psychosocial support have been increasingly, increasingly available in this emergency. But not everything went so well. There was a difficult communication about COVID-19 in ways that promote mental health and psychosocial well-being. Also, organizations of patients and people with lived experiences were not invited from the beginning to participate in the advisory group, but were, were included afterwards. And, and although it seems difficult to understand, especially with the, with the motto of the, this, uh, this year, World Mental Health Day, extra budget was not considered from the beginning. But thanks to the commission's work, a five times increase in mental health budget was finally approved for the next year. More than 10 countries in America has included mental health services as an essential part of government responses to COVID-19. So it doesn't seem to be necessary to have a presidential initiative to address the mental health dimension of this pandemic. But when governments, civil society, and health authorities and others come together to address the mental health dimensions of these pandemics, it's easier to transform mental health services, to shift more mental health services to the community. So I, I have some final uh, um, thoughts or, or, or recommendations. And, and one of them is that the COVID pandemic has been devastating in Latin America and many other regions of the world for not only its direct impact on lives, on, on life, sorry, on physical health, on socioeconomic status of, of individuals, but also for its impact on mental health. So an integrated approach is needed to strengthen the health system. The you service provider. Mateus. Thank you. And research to, to not only manage the current mental health problems related to COVID, but also to develop strategies to, and to allocate more resources to overcome more long-term impact of the pandemic. It is necessary to maintain essential mental health services. Service provision should focus on accessible and equitable evidence-based community care models to train existing primary care staff to adapt to an increased mental health needs to implement the prevention and promotion programs tailored to local needs and to support civil societies and, employer, and employers to address the increased burden of mental illness. Finally, an urgent action is needed to strengthen mental health system in all settings, to monitor the changes in service availability, the delivery and utilization of every country. The COVID-19 presents an opportunity for system changes in Latin America and the world and to improve mental health services. I think that can be one of the um, lessons that we can learn from this um, pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm very willing to have some um, uh, Q&A um, uh, uh, after, after, after the, the other presenter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this um, very interesting presentation. I think uh, that um, just uh, showcasing the problem in the policy developed by PAHO and WHO in what is happening in, in Latin America um, provides an excellent introduction to our next presentation by uh, Maria Elena Medina Mora on the situation in Mexico. Maria Elena is the uh, founder of the Center for Global Mental Health Research at the National Institute of Psychiatry in Mexico. And uh, she's the recently appointed director of the Faculty of Psychology at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. That uh, there is uh, 
like being really a, a CEO of a large organization. Uh, she is the former director of the Mexican National Institute of Psychiatry, and he, she has had a very active role in um, the World Health Organization programs as member of several WHO advisory groups, including the one of the development of the new um, classification of diseases, ICD-11. So, um, Maria Elena, um, I let you the virtual floor, and um, please go ahead. Okay, I I need to share. Okay, thank you. thank you very much for the invitation. I am very happy to be here. I'm very honored by the invitation. So I will focus especially in Mexico. And uh, I will be talking about uh, some concepts, uh, mainly uh, to include the social determinants and also healthcare in this uh, concept uh, known as synergistic epidemic or syndemic. Um, what was happening before the pandemic? What are the new risk factors? Uh, and what had been the impact of uh, the pandemic, but also of the uh, policies to control it? And uh, some challenges and opportunities. So the first thing I want to mention is that uh, we cannot to understand what is happening in, in Mexico and what can be uh, improved to reduce the high burden that the pandemic has, has caused, we need to consider the social determinants. So what has happened is that uh, the sanitary recommendations, as was already mentioned, uh, are difficult to follow up, like wash your hands and stay at home when 30% of the households uh, who have running, uh, don't have running water and those that have running water, they don't have it every day. Uh, there are many uh, households that are overcrowded. 46% uh, of the households don't have uh, uh, access to communication, to internet. 50% uh, of the family heads work in the informal economy, so cannot stay at home. And there has been an increase in poverty, like for instance, this big amount of households where residents have said that they are eating only once a day. So this means that we need to uh, take care of the health care of the members of the minority groups that have less access to health care. Also when they have it, it's of lower quality and uh, they have increased disability due to uncovered needs. Also that we need to think about protection and equity in access to rights and opportunities. And also uh, because the way we distribute goods and services, we can change the lethality of the, of the pandemic. We have seen that eight out of 10 people that die come from underserved populations. And also there is an intersectionality where you have a combination of stigma, discrimination, and accumulation of adversities among those that get sick and die. Um, as uh, uh, Matias has already said, uh, there has been important studies in Latin America, and this was made by Vigo. And the global burden of disease estimated for Mexico was 16% of all the of all the uh, burden for all disorders, which is eight times above the proportion of the health budget assigned to, to deal with the mental health. And it is 33% when we're only considered consider days lost for disability. It, uh, the treatment gap is very big. This is a study uh, from, the world, uh, from the World Mental Health Surveys and here are the countries in Latin America that are part of this, of this uh, study and the United States. Um, a very um, minimal adequate treatment uh, uh, um, I, I indicator was, was uh, formed 
it was very light because they did only included two or more visits of any medical care with pharmacotherapy and four or more visits of psychotherapy and included ongoing treatment. And what we can see here is the very big gap. This is the, um, the services, this in any mental health specialist going to treatment. And even in the United States, it is very low. The average is low. And Colombia, Mexico, and Peru have very, very low rates or very big rates of, uh, of, of the treatment gap. As for mental health resources, how are what type of resources do we have? And we see that in the region, uh, psycho psychologists play a very important role, but, it, but there is very big difference with Mexico having very few persons dedicated to, to mental health, even lower than what we can see in Central, in some countries of Central America, especially psychiatrists. One of the main problems is that this, even though there are a number of psychiatrists trained uh, and graduated every year, uh, they 70% uh, leave uh, stay in the three big cities of Mexico, the metropolitan areas, with very few services in, in, in other in other areas, and it happens also with other with other resources. Uh, the prevalence of uh, stress, anxiety, and depression uh, require a, a big uh, survey that is uh, planned to uh, start next year. But what we know is that uh, the last survey of the, the conducted by the National Institute of Public Health estimated in 2019, 10% as um, uh, depression. This was similar to what was in the World Mental Health Survey. That this was before COVID, and when COVID comes along, the there they were this is a survey, a telephone national survey, telephone survey that of course is leaving out all the population with no telephone, but the proportion is 32% for anxiety and 27% for depression. And also the great, uh, much more bigger um, uh, prevalence when you are talking of people without uh, resources like in here, the low school status. This is very similar to what has been reported for the health personnel that is in average 31%, but it can go almost to 50 in the first level in people working in COVID uh, hospitals in the first line or students that are that are in these in these hospitals that they can have a near 40, 40%, which is also very similar to other systematic reviews. As for alcohol, um, we see that there is a proportion that increased but the bigger proportion reported they were uh, drinking less. And this is a survey from the National Institute of Public Health. And uh, our friend, uh, Dr. Lascano is head of the center. And what we see is that the proportion of people that reduce their drinking is higher than the one, than the proportion that increased. But, the, but this proportion in the second and third wave is increasing also. This is very similar to what uh, PAJO uh, reported for Mesoamerica. That's where Mexico is located with a higher decrease rate than increase rate. What uh, is happening with, uh, with COVID with uh, confinement is the drop of the economy with a very big increase in the amount of uh, poverty. This is 2019 and it goes to, from 11 to 16 in half, like in the, they built three scenarios in uh, Cepal, and uh, in the middle is 15, and uh, this is extreme poverty, and poverty going from uh, 49 to 47, and um, is the highest uh, proportion of, uh, of poverty in the region that is above, much above of the average that is 34. 0.7% of people in, in poverty and increases to 50% in Mexico and Central America. And there are many studies, for instance, this one in Mexico that uh, documented that 60% of people with COVID live in, in municipalities with the highest proportion of, of people without access to services. What we have seen is that there has been uh, uh, 
a system that was developed by the Ministry of Health and the National University and uh, with the help of PAHO. And there was an organization of all centers, uh, treatments, community treatment centers, NGOs, and volunteer uh, psychiatrists are giving their time for free to, uh, to uh, make a, a national system uh, that so far has uh, 100, uh, almost a little bit more than 100,000 per persons have been screened and voluntary treatment in a small proportion. Many of the, the persons only need like advice or information. But violence is by far the most important reason for, for, for taking this, uh, this uh, screening and having the telephone, a telephone call with people uh, that are specialists in mental health. The second one is substance, substance use. We know about alcohol. We know very little about drugs because we have found that uh, availability is there, accessibility is there even for, uh, for drugs that are imported but we don't know what is happening with the drugs. Uh, depression would be the next, the next uh, reason for entering the system. When we see how violence impacts the risk of suicidality, then we see that uh, physical violence increases the risk four times with victims and almost five with perpetrator. These are people that perpetuated violence acts and called this, this system. And for uh, emotional violence, higher than physical violence, but this uh, proportion of people that surpass the limits of sexuality is the highest impact, and we have found that in many of our our surveys. Uh, uh, many of our surveys. What? Uh, how treatment is provided? Most in Mexico, most of the outpatient treatment is provided in the outpatient services of hospitals, of psychiatry hospitals, that were closed during the first part of the of the pandemic, and we see um, that um, there, there were one. It's estimated that 1.5 million people did not receive uh, care for chronic diseases. There were 300. 320,000 fewer hospitalizations compared to the same period of the previous year. And emergency services were reduced by 1 million. So we see that the chronic disorders were not treated and mental health among them. And uh, for instance, self-help groups, that is the most important source for treatment for alcohol, uh, were unable to gather because of the, of the number. We can see here in this other study that these are the psychiatric and psychological subsequent um, uh, consultations and consultations for the first time and how in this year they dropped quite significantly and um, we didn't have the same um, ability as Matias to have the government increase the budget for mental health, the budget for next year. It continues, it continues decrease, decreasing. And for instance, the, the budget for telemedicine that has been a very successful alternative for, for providing services, uh, uh, what the budget was reduced in 87%. So many, many homes don't have internet and now the budget is gonna be less for that. So what are the new COVID challenges from if we want to move from despair to resiliency, and we have to take care of the social determinants and reduce disparity. Um, we, we have to acknowledge what the WHO and many countries have acknowledged of the excess burden over females, mainly those with lower income, and now they have become teachers of their of their of their sons and daughters because uh, the, the schools are closed. Um, so we know that homes with violence are not a safe place for families and children and unemployment and loss of income resources um, are increased the risk of suicide, especially among men. Uh, so we have a, a lot of children out of school. There's 1.5 million children that have abandoned the school system uh, and we have excess deaths 
compared to the cost of uh, compared to the previous year and this has been the cost of hospital reconversion as Mat as matthias was saying we have this uh, reduction of um, of um, hospital care because of reconversion because we had as a, as the main uh, a strategy to treat persons in the specialized systems in the third level of care. Two uh, minutes, Maria Elena. Thank you. This is the, we have the opportunities to reinforce resiliency of communities, to reduce disparities, to really work on what the communities can do to, to uh, get, take care of them and take care of others. At the first level, I think, has to be re-engineered because the, how it, was, it is working now, it's more for uh, uh, infectious diseases and not for a long time care of chronic disorders. So if we want to rely more in the first level of care, we have to change how it is working with a platform that can be linked to community and to general hospitals and uh, cross the gaps of prevention, treatment, and quality. So these are what the, uh, several uh, recommendations to deal with the pre- and post-pandemic challenges. And Matthias has already mentioned all, most of them. Um, maybe that for Mexico, we have the need an integrated health system with mental health incorporated because as for today, it is not completely integrated to the health system, but provided outside the health, the health system. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Elena, uh, particularly for this um, vision on opportunities uh, for a change in mental health related to the pandemics and uh, the focus on resilience. I think it has been very interesting. So we, we can move uh, to uh, the next, um, presentation uh, by um, uh, Professor Denise Rasuk. Uh, she's professor in mental health economics, and um, he has a master of science and PhD in health science from the Department of Psychiatry at the, Uni at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. And um, yeah, she also has an MBA in health management and a postdoctorate in health economics at the King's College in London. Um, Denise participated in, in the previous um, uh, session on the general situation of COVID-19 in, in Brazil. Uh, so um, he's uh, participating in these two aspects, uh, the general um, situation of COVID, and it's available um, in our webpage online, and now on what are the problems related to mental health. Thank you, Denise. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in this event. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to share my presentation now. Just a second. It's not possible to put uh, on full screen. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on mental health in Brazil. Just little words about our health system. Our health system uh, is free with universal health coverage and mental health is included in this uh, health system. And uh, we adopted the Declaration of Caracas in 90s, and uh, our principles are based on human rights of people with mental illness. And also, we adopted the community mental health care model in the whole country. And in the last decades, we saw the closure of psychiatric beds, and to, to, today we have less than 14 uh, psychiatric beds in the country. And our expenditure with mental health is very modest. It's around the federal government spends uh, around 1.5 to 2% of our health uh, expenditure. Uh, our services are organized in a network that you have a primary care specialist, 
uh, on everything starting the primary care and then people can move to another kind of service which is more uh, complex for example, CAPS, the Community Mental Health Center for moderate and severe mental disorders. And also it is focused on uh, psychosocial rehabilitation and social inclusion. But we have all kinds of services about, uh, for example, residential services and hospitals and all kinds of services. Medication is free and uh, this is how it works. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about how it was our scenario before the pandemia, because we each didn't have a good scenario <laughs> before the pandemia. Um, as you can see, mental disorders account for 13%. Uh, Maria Elena said 17, I was surprised, maybe she, she has more updated data. Uh, but uh, around 13% of burden of disease and uh, 36 of uh, years lived with disability. And the main problems in Brazil is uh, anxiety, where one of the first rank in prevalence in anxiety, depression and alcohol, alcohol consumption. Uh, and we see in the last uh, 15 years that uh, the consumption of, of alcohol and drug have doubled in, uh, in this period. Also, we have seen uh, suicide rates increased, especially among the young people, the males, by 50% in five years. 80% uh, of Brazilians live in urban areas and 20 or 30% have some uh, exposed exposition to uh, traumatic events and violence. Uh, also, domestic violence is a big issue in Brazil more than 30% of people reporting domestic violence. And why we have so awful numbers? Uh, of course, uh, we need to take into account the social determinants uh, factors, especially regarding basic needs, uh, poverty, 75% of people live in poor areas and have poor, uh, ed low education, unemployment has been growing not new, um, and, and especially the young people has less opportunities to get the first job. Many of them has no uh, hope in the future. Uh, also, the question of uh, urban violence is a big issue in Brazil. And we have a an, uh, an study from the Universidade de São Paulo uh, that uh, they said that in the slums, for example, 60% of uh, children in poor areas has experienced some kind of important uh, domestic violence, including abuse and another kind of violence. And I think that another important factor is, uh, uh, is about uh, our public policies, not only about health, but all kinds of public policies, social, economic, and health policies, mental health policies, uh, are not targeting the vulnerable groups and uh, not addressing people's needs. We have a, a, a great uh, treatment gap in mental health yet. In some areas, 50 or 60% don't have treatment. And uh, our mental health policy yet, we don't have clear budget and it's not very well financed. Uh, this is our curve now. In two weeks, everything changed. And now we, he, uh, we see the, the number of cases increases again with the number of uh, deaths increases again very rapid and uh, in this scenario we, we don't know if it's the first wave yet or the second wave uh, in the between. Well uh, then COVID was an additional, additional factor of burden in terms of social determinants of health and you can see uh, when you compare the prevalence in Sao Paulo of COVID-19 the poorest has much more uh, bigger prevalence than wealthiest and uh, unemployment uh, has raised by uh, to 14%. Last year it was 11% to 12% and bankruptcy is 65 million people with uh, no income uh, after the pandemic and 10 million uh, formal workers without uh, with a salary reduction, sometimes more than 50%. Uh, also, the prevalence uh, is bigger in, uh, in low education groups. 
uh, a big difference and also black people that uh, usually suffers from loss, less opportunities and poverty and low education, they are more affected by the COVID than the white and other groups. And also indigenous people in some areas in Brazil uh, had fivefold uh, more prevalence than in white people. It's a, a very complicated situation. And then in mental health, we saw after COVID uh, an increase in the uh, mental health symptoms and then change in lifestyle lifestyle and also change in behavior then uh, uh, alcohol consumption was a big problem and and then increased by 18% uh, of daily consumption and uh, and violent behavior as well was striking there are some places that it was more than 200% you know, and this violent behavior, especially against human and the homicide against human also uh, rose too much. Then uh, we see uh, symptoms uh, rise, uh, like anxiety symptoms, depressive symptoms, uh, different uh, kind of uh, habits, uh, sugar intake. And also among people that use tobacco, uh, they use more tobacco than before. And the most affected group, we have two different kinds of uh, uh, studies in the Universidade de Santa Maria in the south of uh, country that are doing a prospective uh, study, uh, online survey. And a uh, few crews and Universidade de Campinas in Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo are doing uh, the same thing. And then uh, the most affected groups in terms of mental health were the human, especially with children, uh, health professionals, uh, the poorest and, the, and people with debts, uh, the youngest, especially in uh, students, and people, of course, with mental health, uh, mental illness. Uh, in terms of the mental health policy during the pandemic, we didn't see too much thing uh, robust. The Minister of Health just declared that they strengthened the, the system, but I, I really don't see any, any robust thing in terms of policy. Uh, they, ha they hire 30 mental health professionals to give some support for health professionals in the front line of COVID. Uh, always. Only on, in August, the end of go, August, they started to, to talk about mental health and then they, they said about the project of Ministry of Health is mentalized with only lectures in YouTube, it's just that. And Phil Cruz has wrote, uh, wrote a lot of uh, guidelines about suicide, about how to deal with uh, mental health problems and uh, especially to health, uh, pro, uh, health managers and other professionals too. We have some another uh, initiatives that are good. For example, in the Maranhão, it's state in the north of São Paulo, uh, sorry, the north of Brazil. And they use uh, the primary care as a network of services and they test everybody. And also at the same time, they use it to focus, focus it on humanization, to combat feeling as a result of social distancing, exams and testing everybody, and also psychologists in the primary care giving recommendation to clients and support and also support health professionals. It was a very good uh, initiative that working very well, especially in small cities. Uh, this is the Universidade de Santa Maria, the research center, and then uh, they, they are monitoring PTSD symptoms. And the majority, of, sorry, the majority of people didn't receive any kind of uh, treatment in mental health. And uh, another group in our university in São Paulo, Provi, that is specialized in uh, PTSD with uh, a partnership with Santa Maria, are doing the same uh, 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 study, but also they, uh, they take care of health professionals in the front line and make a lot of educational videos and PTSD research. Another study in an initiative in the Universidade de São Paulo, in slums in São Paulo, in Sapopemba, in poor areas, training uh, uh, community leaders uh, in mental health to approach people in slums. And then there is a, a phone uh, line that uh, 
people can approach, uh, be approached by mental health professionals, usually social workers, and provide some kind of support. The same university, they created a software that can be used in Android or iPhone, it's uh, free, uh, to monitor the mental health status uh, by mobile, uh, especially uh, health professionals, and then uh, have some care. And also now they are using the same software for students, uh, including medical students. Uh, we saw some kind of uh, mental health campaign. It was local, it was not national. Then we see something uh, against alcohol and drug consumption. We, we see one campaign against domestic violence. And if you use this kind of red sign and then you, go to a drugstore and just show the sign they they call the police they know that the human is in danger and there is an app for calling for police also also some other initiative uh, uh, for against depression it's a campaign many of them not linked with ministry of health well uh, which are the challenges main challenges now uh, I think that this moment is very critical because COVID is spreading again in very rapidly. Many hours uh, 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 hospital are occupied now. Uh, and then people's behavior is a big problem. The adherence to quarantine is uh, it's finished. There is no uh, uh, adherence. As you can see here, in Sao Paulo especially, but in Rio de Janeiro also we have now clandestine uh, parties uh, with uh, 1,000 people, no using mask, no using anything, with drug and alcohol in a, in a closed uh, space. And uh, it's a very complicated in terms of expression. And they use the, the network, and the, the internet to organize this kind of thing. And uh, what is very important, I think, is in cultural uh, habit, in social, uh, in Brazil and Latin America culture, uh, people need to be together, need to, to be uh, in, co in touch and hugs, etc. And people need to be outside. And then this is an urgent need that it's not possible to say just stay home for the young people. After eight months of quarantine, do you know? In the beginning, people were dehydrated, but now it's very complicated. And we see crowding for the whole city, in the whole country. And, and now the most pro problematic issue for the majority of people is financial distress. People consider this the most important thing, how they are going to overcome this problem. And Three minutes, and Denise. Most, yes, thank you. This is the last one. Is the most important thing, I think, that when you think about uh, potential uh, solutions, we need to involve all sectors of society uh, and try to, to, to find some creative alternative. Uh, focus on vulnerable people is very important. Reinforce primary care has an important role in Brazil and, and integrate mental health in these actions. Integrate mental health in all kinds of policies of COVID-19, not uh, separate from health and also align, alignment of social, economic, and health, mental health policy. And uh, university research centers has a very important role. They can support technical support, capacity building. There are many uh, important things that universities can do. They are doing not only research and trying to help uh, uh, to draw policies. Uh, technology access is a big problem in Brazil, especially for the poor. Uh, and technology can be good and bad if people organize how to be crowded, but always is very important uh, for people. Uh, new alternative in terms of quarantine. You cannot uh, keep all people uh, in home for, for, every, for one year or two years after uh, you wait for the vaccine. We need to have another kind of strategy. Now it's not working anymore. Inspection is not doing well. Education, because our schools are still closed and are going to be open very soon. We are starting our summer in, in February, probably this will be open. 
and then we need to give support to teachers and to students. And I think that is in this moment very complicated in political, we are in the middle of the elections and uh, uh, we have a very complicated uh, political uh, scenario, but now Brazilians need especially hope and good examples because people feel uh, they are abandoned by the government and they need to find some strategy to overcome all these problems. And you are aiding the, the vaccine uh, for maybe uh, to start a vaccination, uh, maybe in March, we don't know yet. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Denise. Um, it has been very interesting to uh, listen to all these issues. And um, uh, we can start the uh, Q&A. There are, there are many questions. About, uh, there are uh, several mentions to um, what you said about the need for, or for an integrated care system, the importance of integrated care. Um, uh, there is another question for Maria Elena on the intersectionality of the different components and uh, how different is the level of integration of care in Brazil, in Mexico, and in Chile. Uh, I will start uh, by uh, asking a bit more about this question and um, I will ask Matias because we know that out of the three countries where there has been a major effort in integrating care has been there. And there are all these system of uh, mental health in primary care. Um, how this has been impacted of what has been the influence of the developments in integrated care in, in Chile in relation to the pandemics? Thank you for the question. I think it's, um, it's an important one and, and it has to do that uh, um, if, if we keep the model, the, 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 the pyramid model of services, of, if we change uh, that model during the, the pandemic. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we made a, a mental health action plan, which was very important in, in, in the first month of the pandemic to try to organize the response. Because, uh, this is a major emergency. It's a, it's a, it's, uh, it's nothing compared with the earthquakes or, or anything that uh, we had before. And uh, between the seven areas that uh, we define as uh, priorities, uh, the first one was the continuity of care and strengthening the mental health services, especially in, in uh, primary health care. So, so the goal of this area was to strengthen the, the strategies in public health network to uh, approach mental health, uh, safe ward and access, opportunity and continuity of mental health care in primary care, and in outpatient also of hospitalization and more specialized uh, um, services. So some of the strategies, uh, Luis, that, uh, that we included, for example, was uh, to try to adapt the health network for the care of people with mental health needs. Um, Maria Elena mentioned, but uh, for example, using technology was very important for primary health care groups. Mm. Uh, we started with telephone and, and we finished with, uh, uh, with uh, online uh, telemedicine with a, with a governmental uh, platform that, that was very su successful. But uh, uh, during the first months, it was very difficult to do the continuity of care, uh, which is the basis mm, uh, of mental health care in, at the primary health care level. The, one of the other actions that uh, we did was support of the continued mental health actions at the regional level. Uh, uh, Chile is very long and we have uh, a lot of difference between regions and it was important to uh, try to, um, to, 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 to do a good effort to, to try to keep the quality of care in the different regions because um, some regions um, had a lot of uh, uh, death and, 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 and contagious rate but some of the regions not, so it was very difficult to try to organize the country in that way. The other thing was that the delivery of mental health care recommendation because in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic to optimize the resources. It was uh, very difficult until now to keep essential functioning on a management of resources in the mental health care network and also to protect the management of mental health network for the approach and continuity of care 
of people at high risk, for example, suicidal behavior, psychosis, behavioral disorders that they increase, at least in terms of um, uh, what we had in emergency care and, and many other settings uh, during the pandemic. Um, so, so we 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 need we needed to organize the services, but at the same time, uh, we, it was um, uh, a, a major impact for us that, uh, for example, when we discussed the budget, uh, primary health care was not included at the at the first uh, during the first stages of the discussion. So, so all the the, the mentality, the, the 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 way of doing things, were uh, we need more beds, we need more. Uh, ventilators, we need more specialized care, but no more primary health care. So it was very difficult to try to, to keep uh, in, in the discussion the importance of uh, primary health care. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matias. And this is in contrast with, with what uh, uh, we got from Cuba, where the, there was a critical component of primary care from the very beginning, and uh, really the rates um, are, are quite significant how they have managed this situation there. Uh, if, if we just move this question on, on continuity and integration of care from Chile to Mexico, I would say that we have the two extremes of um, models of mental health care. I, my feeling of Mexico is that it's a, it's a hospital based system and with uh, high levels of standards of uh, care provision in Mexico City and some other cities. But as you mentioned, Maria Elena, with huge gaps in rural areas in, in, in other places. Uh, you mentioned, Maria Elena, to what extent this was, this could be also an opportunity for change. Um, what is the situation there? It could be a reason for moving to a community health model in Mexico? It is difficult to say because, I mean, people are convinced that mental health is important and that, that mental health has to be dealt with. And But the issue is that the community, when I, when I was talking about community resiliency, is that formerly, for instance, the communities uh, organized themselves and poor communities decided which uh, female could take care of the children of all while all the females went to work. And then the government would pay this uh, special uh, household that was taking care of the children and they were supervised if they were taking good care of the children and that was working very well. But when this government arrived, he uh, discontinued all the all the budget that was uh, for NGOs. So we have now, then comes the crisis with no NGOs helping the, the poor communities. And he's providing the money directly to the to every person so they can take <coughs> and send the children whatever they want. But what happens in a very poor family that is eating one time a day, it is very, I mean, they will not pay for for early school for their children anymore. No. So I think that the community structure was, uh, is not in there anymore. And the services for the, the primary care is more oriented toward infectious diseases and uh, like if someone falls or has no uh, tradition of dealing with chronic disorders except for obesity that was introduced in the former government and is still there and it's a very important uh, primary. Uh, so they, it's like uh, a special program that, that uh, provides money, including diabetes, which is a very high uh, incidence in Mexico. There is no, I mean, we have not been looking to introduce treatment of depression in primary care. Our studies show that uh, patients and doctors don't think primary care is a good place for dealing with these disorders, except when we have included a treatment of depression within the diabetes or obesity. And then it is very, very good. The results are really very good. And the doctors immediately change their mind because their patients do better when depression is taken care of. So I think we have those evidence that can help 
now to change. I'm not too sure that the community model based on community uh, cohesion and uh, as I was saying, resiliency and working together for taking care of everybody uh, can have the future because the person that is in charge does not believe in that, is not using a mask, is still thinking that the epidemic is not a real thing, is not a real problem, and is not taking care of data. So the, I think that the message is that they are providing, and it's not only Mexico, we, I think the three most effective uh, countries in the region have the same problem. <laughs> so, um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm not too sure, but I think and the other issue that it was very similar to what uh, Matias was saying. So the, the Mexican people really do voluntary work a lot with the, with the earthquakes, and, but it was very disorganized and following a WHO program that was, uh, that Bajo helped us build, we made a program for, uh, for crisis intervention. And this model was used to do this very big program that has taken care to all community care to all the all con, all uh, states in Mexico, with the centers for drugs started treating also uh, mental health and centers for community centers for mental health also using uh, uh, also taking care of addictions and then NGOs and all the associations put free time to do that. So this has worked very well and if the university put the technology and so many people, more than 70 institutions work for free. The main issue is how to make this stay because I mean in a crisis we're very good for that but not very good for <laughs> because mental health is still not integrated in the health system so but I think that we have do, we do have hopes and opportunities and we we should work for them. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. And, and then we can move the question to Brazil, where we have huge difference across the different states and where, um, on the other hand, you mentioned, Denise, how this um, integration and intersectorality of, of care should go beyond health, that are all these uh, social aspects uh, that you mentioned. Um, how, how do you see this um, uh, integration cross-disciplinarity uh, from the point of view of Brazil? I think that it's very uneven in Brazil because you have some regions that uh, we don't have uh, any kind of uh, resource uh, and then primary care may be one the unique resource in some areas of Brazil, especially in very small cities or in very small areas with uh, more then uh, primary care is very, very important uh, in these situations. When you go to big cities, then the situation is a little bit uh, difficult, uh, especially because people are going more to more complex uh, system service. For example, uh, we don't have CAPS, Community Mental Health Service, in all uh, uh, cities in Brazil, but we have almost uh, uh, primary care in, in in whole country. Then uh, there, there is a, a part of them uh, that uh, mental health professionals should support health primary care. Uh, in uh, Sao Paulo, it doesn't work very well. Then, and then what Elena was said, that uh, people don't like to go to primary care or, or don't, don't believe that primary care is the best way to treat uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, but uh, it is in uh, in a free uh, uh, system is the only way is, is to to search for uh, primary care because if you have uh, some uh, more complicated disease, then you need uh, uh, to be referred to CAPS. But before going to CAPS, you need to to go to primary care. Then the design of system uh, force people to use uh, primary care. And uh, the budget for primary care and for the cities is one budget. There is no especially specific, specifically budget for mental health. It's not very clear each municipality can use uh, the, the budget in, uh, in some way. Then it's not very clear how they use the budget. 
Uh, and uh, then primary care in this situation, like we have now, uh, everybody understood because before the pandemic, people wanted private care, you know, the, the government wanted to privatize everything. But during the pandemic, it was very clear that uh, uh, our public health system was very strong. They created beds, they, uh, uh, primary care has an important role. Everybody that has any kind of problem needs to go first to the primary care, even to, to, uh, about, uh, to know if they have COVID or not. But uh, this is not uh, uh, equal in, in the whole country, do you know? This model is well uh, understood in Brazil. I think that the people defend this model. I, I, I don't see any kind of uh, people said, they'll no, this is not a good model. What has some divergence, especially among psychiatrists, that uh, this uh, system is not enough to cover all kinds of problems and then you need more complex outpatient care, not only CAPS, and there are some divisions, but people are not addressing the uh, hospital system as the main problem. And um, in terms of uh, investment, it's very, very strange because sometimes you, you see another kind of ministry uh, doing investments in mental health, but it's not a ministry of health another kind of ministry. Sometimes the judge, sometimes other sectors are made, for example, they, they made a campaign for domestic violence. It was not the Ministry of Health. Do you, do you know? And then you see many different initiatives and spend money in different budgets, but uh, uh, no, there is no integration and no uh, communication between mental health sectors and other sectors outside health that are, and then we spend money without any kind of uh, optimization, you know. And, uh, but this var varies too much from one region to another. It's not uh, yeah. uniform. Uh, uh, Denise, uh, thanks a lot. We have a question for you uh, from um, uh, Professor Alan Rosser and uh, Vivian Miller. Uh, they, they are uh, major leaders here in Australia on, on um, the uh, mental health issues related to indigenous people and what are uh, the problems of colonization, the aspects of uh, the health and the mental health of the indigenous population. And uh, they are asking about uh, the impact of uh, COVID and um, uh, in um, indigenous communities in Brazil, particularly in the Amazon uh, basin, what was happening there? Uh, I don't know too much details on that, but uh, what I say that uh, there is no specifically program, especially to address their needs, their, uh, their needs. And then uh, in, many, in many regions in Amazon and all, all regions related, uh, people, there, there was a delay to get the treatment, but uh, it's, the problem with indigenous were, were especially in those uh, that were in the city also. The mortality and the prevalence was very high especially on the indigenous that were in the city. Uh, I see that uh, there are many problems to, to address. The president didn't allow any kind of specific measures and he was criticized because of that. And many people died in, uh, in some groups. Uh, and uh, I think that is local, local initiative. I don't know in details how they deal with that. But uh, probably, I, I guess, probably local uh, initiative, maybe NGOs, uh, NGOs in general try to help with this kind of uh, situation. But I don't have too much details uh, how it was uh, working. Thank you. And uh, we have a similar situation both in, in Chile and in, in Mexico. Matias, there has been any 
any specific um, goal or program related to the Mapuche uh, population or, or, or other indigenous population in, in, in Chile, in North Chile? Well, um, we included the indigenous population uh, um, as uh, one of the vulnerable uh, specific population that uh, should be addressed in, in the action plan for, for COVID, for mental health action plan for COVID. Uh, but, uh, but it's been uh, quite difficult because uh, you know, in, in Chile we, we are having not, not only the, the COVID the pandemic and problem, but also um, we started um, with a deep social and political crisis uh, during the last year and, and and, and that changed everything in terms of uh, uh, what we can do uh, in terms of, uh, of policies. And it's been difficult because uh, uh, some of the um, uh, political issues uh, has been with the indigenous population, with the Mapuche population. Uh, so for us working at the Ministry of Health has been uh, quite difficult to, 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 to push forward. Uh, all the uh, policies and activities that uh, we have uh, with uh, with that population, uh, so so it's been a challenge, and, uh, Luis. It's a it's a um, it's a um, uh, difficult task over a difficult task you know, to to manage uh, an, a pandemic, and at the same time to try to focus uh, the uh, the action um, in vulnerable populations. Uh, it was easier for us, for example, to uh, make uh, actions and, and activities. For, for women and uh, children uh, and uh, older people that indigenous population than in Mapuche. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very hot topic now in, in, in Chile. And, and, and as uh, Denise uh, told us, uh, probably uh, in the region. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, you just mentioned the effect of the crisis. And this was the, another question for you. Uh, this is a crisis on the top of a crisis that started uh, two years before. Um, how has this impacted in, in the planning in Chile? Well, that's a good question because uh, we, uh, we already had uh, in 2019 a, a social movement. It's a, it's a movement that emerged to demand social justice and, and equity in many, in many areas that includes also health and, and mental health. That was uh, uh, very important because uh, I think that the that the social movement, the social crisis, uh, 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 included mental health as, as one of the of the important topics. Hmm? So, so the social outburst uh, uh, at the first uh, stage paralyzed the country, but but then the demonstration in the streets. Uh, turned more violent uh, and generated a crisis of, of le legitim le legitimacy. Hmm? And, and that included the police, the army, and the political system. Hmm? And, and that even included the, the health system. So um, sometimes political crisis um, can, can influence other areas hmm, that are not, uh, at the first time, really connected. Hmm? And for example, for us, this political crisis gave rise to, to a referendum that uh, we had uh, almost uh, one month ago for a new constitution. So, so that's the, the, the size, the, the impact of this, this social outburst that uh, we are having now in the country. Um, and, and many of the demands for greater equity in access to health system were, were, were also for, or particularly for mental health. Uh, so that allow, allowed us to foresee that the, the impact of the pandemic on mental health uh, could deepen the social unrest and demands on the health system. And, and, and that's why it's been um, a very important topic. And I think it's related with the presidential initiative. Mental health was uh, not only in the agenda in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, politics, but also uh, in the agenda of, of many other groups and, 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 and the population in general. And, and traditional political opinion polls incorporated questions about mental health for, for the first time uh, in, in many years. And almost half of the respondents uh, said that their mood uh, worsened during the pandemic, for example, increased sadness, fear, and I think it, it happened in many countries. 
but but it it, it could it was also paradoxical that uh, for example 15 percent of the respondents perceived that uh, the mental health improved with the pandemic um, and and it's difficult to understand if, if it's the pandemic or the the social unrest or the social demonstration that uh, in some way in, improve um, the, um, um, the 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 sense of connection uh, with other people and um, um, mental health in a in a more general way. Um, so it's been a, a very uh, an important challenge for us, Luis, to to give in this context uh, to include the mental health policies in response to the pandemic and to include uh, mental health as a, as a relevant role um, to mitigate the, the effects. Uh, of this crisis. Uh, so that's uh, one very important topic that uh, we are working on. And um, it's been very uh, difficult because uh, there have been some cases of uh, human rights violation and um, a lot of violence in, in many dem demonstrations. So, so, so it's, it's, it's been really a challenge for us to work in mental health uh, uh, during this pandemic and over that, the social unrest. But, but I think it can it can move things uh, uh, further uh, than if uh, uh, we haven't had uh, the social unrest. Well, th thank you, um, Matthias. And um, but we are over time, but I, I I would not like to finish without um, asking Maria Elena of something that you have the three of you have mentioned that I think it's something very important in Latin America and it's. Uh, violence, the uh, how you have showcased the problem of suicide that was something seen separately in most places. This this relationship between violence and suicide. We have um, a, a major um, uh, researcher on violence in in Latin America here at the new uh, associate professor Vladimir Canudas, and uh, I would like uh, just to ask very briefly. Maria Elena, what, what is your vision on how, from mental health, this um, issue of violence can be um, um, uh, analyzed or, or, or addressed? Well, the, well, it is very important because in Mexico, the rate, because of the drug dealers and the, the, the role that uh, drug trafficking plays in, in disappearance and homicides. Uh, we have a very high rate of homicides, a very high rate of uh, violence in communities that are near the growing opium areas, for instance, and the fights for the markets uh, of the drug dealers. And in, in that context, then the violence against females also increases. And we have seen that in these communities, violence is so normalized that females think it is okay for their husbands to hit them and children think it is okay that the teachers hit them. And so we have made uh, important uh, interventions in communities to denormalize violence and, and it really works. And when you in, in, incorporate depression and post-traumatic stress disorders, treatment by general uh, physicians, it really works. So I think it is a good, I mean, people are really worried, much more worried about violence and, than depression. But I think that uh, we can, I mean, providing this data, making this data available, so it shows how we can really work two things together to diminish uh, the problem. It is, uh, it is an area of hope. And I just want to see, say one thing about the indigenous communities in Mexico. You know that we have uh, 52 living languages being spoken, different languages being spoken now. Uh, in Mexico, and they people from this uh, origin are mostly in the south, and the regions who, that where most indigenous population live are the ones that have the lowest rate of COVID and the lowest rate of death. And what the indigenous communities have done is close their communities and do a very affirmative actions to prevent. Uh, so that's something very interesting. The Indian the people indigenous community that live in the big cities. They have the highest rates because they are the most uh, impoverished and uh, marginalized. But in the original communities, they they are doing the work very well. <laughs> so the only green state is one that is uh, mostly uh, indigenous population. Oh, well, thank you very much. I think it's a very important point. 
thank you all of you and I will let um, Noel uh, close the session. Please, Noel. Thanks very much, uh, Luis. Let me just dial into my last couple of slides and I'll close the session. Okay. So listen, thanks very much to you all. I think it was a tremendously, uh, tremendously rich discussion that we've had in relation to the mental health impacts of uh, COVID. Uh, so thanks to you, Matthias, to Maria Elena, to Denise, and also to you for moderating, uh, Luis. I guess there are two particular things that stood out to me. Uh, one was the alarming increase in mental health related issues as a result of COVID from anxiety to depression to substance addiction to the increase in violence. And the second point that stood out to me was the interconnectedness of the political and socioeconomic and health, including mental health impacts of COVID. And I guess uh, you have all been one in concluding that there's a tremendous need therefore to consider mental health as an integral component of the response to COVID and the need to provide adequate resources for mental health programs, the need to address the disruption that mental health services has endured as a result of COVID, but also, and more positively, the opportunity that COVID has provided to reset or, or to look again at the systemic possibilities for systemic change to improve mental health uh, services. So that said, let's look ahead to the fifth and final webinar in this series, which will be in Thursday of next week, the 3rd of December at 9am Australian time. And on Wednesday evening, the 2nd of December, Latin American time. As you'll note from the program for this session, it'll be conducted in Spanish and we'll try to draw together some of the main lessons learned from the first four sessions to a broader audience in Latin America. So it would be great if those of you in Latin America right now could, could promote this final webinar to your own networks of colleagues uh, and export experts. Let me um, also thank the supporting institute, institutions that are flagged on the screen, uh, the Latin American embassies here in Canberra, the Australian Studies Centre in Montevideo, the Australian Academy of Science, let me also thank uh, most sincerely Marita Linkson for handling so capably the logistics of today's webinar. And please, uh, if any of you have any comments or inquiries arising from today's webinar or indeed any of the sessions so far, please feel free to be in contact with us via email. And uh, feel free too to fill out the evaluation questionnaire which will be sent to you automatically when the sessions close. So, mil gracias de nuevo for having joined us today. Until next week, when the session will be in Spanish. Hasta la semana que viene, cuando la sesión será en castellano. Stay safe, cuídense mucho, and hasta la próxima.